My guest tonight is an author, and he is a teacher. He's one of the foremost exponents of the power of myth to direct and shape an individual's life, and perhaps the direction of a culture as well. And history itself, as a matter of fact. He's a specialist in comparative mythology. His work encompasses many diverse subjects, including Tantra, the pre-Christian mysteries, Gnosticism, Shamanism, which we'll be discussing at length tonight, Alchemy, Astrology. He's a naked eye astronomer of great skill. And his name is John Lash. He's a remarkable man. He's a, a gentleman that I had the great fortune of uh, meeting and spending time with last October. As you may remember, those of you who have been listening to the program for that length of time, you'll know that I was in Massachusetts and spent time with John and uh, Joanna, of course, who you're familiar with. Uh, but he's someone that we've been looking forward to having on the program uh, with great anticipation and uh, live tonight from his home in Belgium. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, John Lash, welcome to Radio Orbit. John, wonderful to have you, finally. Well, thank you, Mike. It's a great fortune to be here with you. Uh, I'm very pleased to have met you in October, and that way I can kind of, I know what you look like, so I can kind of visualize <laughs> you there in front of me. Yeah, me and, too. Uh, it's, but it's very good to be on the line with you. Yeah, me too, John. It's a, it's a pleasure and a long time coming, and there have been a lot of people that have uh, uh, been looking forward to this for a long time, so I'm glad we have a chance to do it. So, All right, well, look, I've, uh, I'm going to make the use of my time. I just spent the last half hour trying to get you on the phone, believe it or not, <laughs> and, and uh, so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna make, uh, make it worthwhile tonight. I, I've been talking to the, to the listeners a little bit as we've been getting going tonight about you and your background and the fact that there are many different topics that we could probably talk about uh, we narrowed it down a little bit uh, off the air, but before we get into the topic of the evening, primarily shamanism, for my listeners, John, who aren't real familiar with you, why don't you give them just a quick background, a little bit of framework so they know who you are, uh, where you've come from, and, uh, uh, and give, them a, give them a good reason why they should, uh, why they should hearken this evening. Uh, well, sure, I'll, I'll give it a try. I don't I usually talk about myself, but I'll <laughs> see what I can come up with. Uh, the basics are uh, that I was uh, born in New York City, and um, because of personal circumstances in my mother's life, I grew up in a small town in Maine called Friendship, a small lobster fishing village. And that was a great uh, shift in my destiny, the fact that I was born in a large city, but at the age of four found myself in this idyllic fishing village because my connection with nature actually began at that point hmm. and my life would have obviously been very different if I had if my mother had remained in the city so I grew up in uh, I mean I've, I've, I've traveled around the world I've been to I think about 30 35 countries seen a fair amount of the world and hmm. friendship Maine is one of the most beautiful places that I've that I've ever seen. Amazing. So I had the opportunity to grow up in natural, unspoiled natural beauty. Hmm. And that has a lot to do with who I am and how I found my path in life. Um, the other parts of my biography that might be helpful, I can just think of three things very quickly. One is that I began to have mystical or paranormal experiences at an early age. And uh, I'm a great believer in the in spontaneous enlightenment and in the experience of mystical states or satori or whatever you would want to call it as coming to someone without practice, uh, coming to someone just naturally, uh, because that happened to me, and, and I don't think I'm the only one that that's ever happened to in that manner. <clears throat> so throughout my life, from a very early stage, I was not so much seeking to go on a spiritual quest whereby I would enter a path and do practices to achieve something. Rather, I went on a spiritual quest in the attempt to understand what was happening to me hmm. and why I had these uh, extraordinary encounters and these moments of, of mystical illumination and so forth. So that really determined the trajectory of my life from uh, dreams I had, lucid dreams, uh, at about the age of four, really. Wow. And then following that, I had a hard time in school. I had a hard time adopting to 
the system, although I was a uh, an honor student and that sort of thing, and I loved to learn. I dropped out of college uh, because I couldn't I couldn't play the game. Hmm. So in the uh, early '60s, I dropped out, and I've, I'm basically self-educated. I don't have a degree in comparative mythology, even though that's my field. And then uh, it just went on from there. I would say that uh, the uh, experiences of my life led me to question beliefs and to question uh, particularly the beliefs that I had been taught or told. I don't think you can say we're really taught beliefs. We're just told what to believe. Right. And since we're told at an early age, even if we as children... Uh, think that what we're told to believe is nonsense, uh, it's very difficult to resist it. It's very difficult for the child to stand up and, and challenge what they are told to believe. But I've always had that tendency uh, for some reason, and that led me pretty much to where I am now. <clears throat> uh, the books I've written have all been about questioning beliefs and looking into the supernatural and paranormal aspects of human experience. Excuse me. And my interest in mythology, lifelong interest, and in the mythology of the stars and the sky, for instance, has been uh, driven by the fact that I believe that there is information in the world at large, in the cosmos at large. I think it was Huxley who coined the term mind at large. Mm. And uh, I would say that the whole course of my life, from those days in Friendship, Maine, uh, where I had the opportunity to walk on the beautiful coast of Maine and swim in those waters and, and, and row out to those islands and be in contact with nature. Mm. The drift of my life from that moment has been to understand the mind of nature and to consider or imagine how we might have a way of life that is not based on belief and unsupported, uh, principles and, and dogmas, but based on a living contact with, with the mind of nature. Mm. And that pretty much, as you know, Mike, that pretty much sums up what I'm working on these days uh, in Metahistory Org and in the other writing that I'm doing. Right. And let's do that, John. Let's give out the website real quickly uh, one more time. Everyone, if you're interested in information about John and the work that he's doing, uh, jump on the web and go over to metahistory.org, M-E-T-A history dot O-R-G. It's a fascinating website, and it's like a it's like a a good book actually. Meta history is uh, a yeah, fifteen hundred sort of, page book. Yeah, <laughs> so, and and, and so the, take your time. <laughs> the, and and the reason I I use that reference is because you can sort of click anywhere, and wherever you end up, you can sort of just jump in there and find something cool. And a good book I've always thought is one that you can just sort of open up, and uh, put your finger down in the middle of the page and start reading at that point and be uh, somehow engrossed, and, and that, that's the way meta history is. It's very deep, and there's a tremendous amount of information there, and I appreciate the work that you guys have done there. So, Well, thank you, Mike. All right, so there are lots we could talk about. Uh, your resume spans a collection of many different disciplines. We decided tonight to talk a little bit about shamanism. Uh, it's one of my favorite topics and one that I don't think, John, can be really overestimated in the terms of, of its relevance uh, to the cultural dilemmas that we that, that we seem to be facing currently, uh, not not just as Americans, and of course you're uh, in in Europe, and I'd be interested uh, in some of your uh, perspectives from from that uh, particular vantage point as well. But uh, but as a species in general, it's something that has struck me for many years now. Something that is very very important. So I think where we should start get start uh, where where we should get started. Maybe you could uh, give us a little bit of a background on shamanism as a as a definition, what you think it means actually to begin with. Well, sure, I'd like to do that. I'd also like to uh, uh, suggest to to the listeners that apart from the uh, material on shamanism uh, on on meta history, uh, there's a wonderful book by uh, by Ralph Metzner, which I'm mm -hmm. sure you know very well, called uh, uh, Tio Nanakato, the Sacred uh, Mushroom Visions. And uh, that book has an introduction in it. Uh, it has several essays, and, and uh, it has a very long introduction called uh, Visionary Mushrooms of the Americas. Mm. 
and I'm looking at it right now. It's about, it's a beautiful book, and it's uh, 48 pages long, this introduction. The book is uh, published by Park Street Press, so I guess that would be Inner Traditions. <clears throat> anyway, that 48 or 45-page uh, essay by Ralph Metzner covers the modern revival of shamanism. And uh, since I place myself in that movement and, and consider that I belong to that, uh, that would probably be a good a good place to start. Uh, I strongly suggest that that book and especially that article to uh, anyone who wants to get uh, an overview of what has happened since uh, the, the 1940s, since just before the uh, Second World War, uh, <clears throat> in terms of the contemporary uh, face of shamanism. Now, uh, we all know, of course, that shamanism is, is a very ancient, uh, you know, path. Uh, I used to, uh, have a joke. I, I always used to try to joke when I was talking about spiritual things back in Santa Fe years ago when I was teaching. And, uh, sometimes my jokes went over pretty well, sometimes they didn't. <laughs> but, but this is back in like the, the mid seventies. And at that time, actually, shamanism was just coming into vogue right, right. and at one point I was having a conversation with someone and we were talking about various spiritual matters you know in the in the new age under the new age umbrella and they said to me you know well, gee what about shamanism you know Michael Harner has uh, written this book and it looks like uh, this is uh, something that might be worth looking at and I shook my head and I said uh, uh, just it's just a flash it'll never last <laughs> <laughs> it's only lasted for what two million years or it's something. only lasted <laughs> For the whole history of our species, really, you know, right. and uh, yet the fact is that it has become a a tendency, a a, a it has become part of a kind of revival mm. since the late forties. So I would suggest that there are we should take a a dyadic view and always have in our minds a concept of what shamanism is that is in the ancient sense in its most ancient timeless sense okay. and then have and then look at it what it is in a contemporary sense right, and that, okay. that's how I view it good. so in its ancient sense in timeless sense shamanism is the practice of uh, exploring worlds that are uh, outside the cultural model of society it's something that uh, Every society, every human society, every human culture, in order to be a culture, must define itself on human terms. And so it must be self-referential because the culture is a organization of individuals who are together uh, for to survive together and to serve their own needs and to create a human world. But that human world is always set in a non-human world. And... In its ancient sense, the shaman was the intermediary between human culture and the human-made world and everything that, that lay beyond it. Mm. And basically, what, what lies beyond the human-made world can be viewed in two ways. First of all, it's just the, the, the setting of nature and the uh, habitat and the ecosphere in which other species live, other than human species that's part of it. And the second part of it is it, it includes the, the non-human environment of any culture or community includes the uh, supernatural dimension, the Nahual, mm. the unknown, the realm of dreams, the realm of departed spirits, the realm of demons and angels. And so that is the setting. Uh, nature and supernature, you might say, Mike, perhaps, mm. Mm. are the setting for any human culture and the, the genius of the ancient shamanic practice is that the shamans knew that no culture and no community can exist in that setting and be isolated from that setting and merely ignore it. Therefore, there have to be always members of, of a community who are intermediate mediaries. You know, not everyone in your community can be or should be a shaman. Hmm. This is not the way it was in the ancient model. Right. And I think that as far as the ancient model goes, that still holds up pretty well. But for a community or culture to 
to be sane and to survive, there must be members of that culture who go outside of it into nature, into contact with other species, and into the supernatural, supernatural dimension, and bring back their experiences to the community. That is the primordial model of shamanic, of the shamanic role. Uh, and, and, and I think it's also, uh, as far as I know, and I think there are many people who would agree with me, uh, historians, prehistorians, and anthropologists, as far as I know, that is a very stable and reliable model for human community and culture. Whereas the model that we have been following for uh, some thousands of years now is based on a cutting off of the human community from those two other dimensions. Hmm. And we have become too human in a sense. We have become too human-centered. We have lost the interspecies connection and we have lost our sense of the supernatural. And that is why we have a sick society today. And I believe that the shamanic way still is, as it always was, a great uh, remedy to our sickness. Hmm. All right, well, so this is the past, and it goes back, we joked about it a little bit earlier, but it does go back a tremendous, a tremendously long time, right? Well, no one can say how long it goes back. You know, the shamans of, of South America, there's this wonderful book called The Three Halves of, I uh, can't remember what it's called, Three Halves of, uh, of Italo Cavo or mm. something like that. It's a, it's a book. No, The Three Halves of Eno Moksho. Mm. It's a uh, wonderful book on shamanism in which uh, one of the South American shamans from the, the great wetlands of the Amazon says, it's a joke that shamans were walking on the earth 20 million years ago. Right, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and, and this is a topic that sort of comes up, and I'll digress for a moment, but over the last few weeks I've had it come up a few times, the idea of deep time, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, it just seems that, or at least to certain people and to some of my listeners, they're, they're very tentative in believing uh, or, or buying full well the ideas of dating and things like this and you know the idea that we really know exactly when all of these things happened in in the uh, in the last five billion years when uh, you, you know when our data sample is, is is so small I guess certainly and the methods of dating are, are really highly questionable I mean you have to uh, be you have to accept that they're merely a convention mm and that they have very little intrinsic truth in them, we really don't know. Uh, the best way to know what happened to our species is not to go scrabbling for evidence uh, which isn't there or construct fantasy systems which uh, allow us to pretend that we know what happened in prehistory. Mm -hmm. uh, the best way to know what happened to our species is to tap the species memory and I think it's becoming uh, understood now at least uh, I'm trying to uh, develop this point and uh, make this point that was also one of the uh, experiences of shamanism particularly ethnogenic shamanism mm. uh, shamans who went to the plant teachers and learned from the plant teachers as, say, for instance, ayahuasqueros today, uh, were shown by the plant teachers how to access the racial and the genetic memory of the species. And that's the best way, that's the most reliable way to know uh, how we evolved. And, uh, you know, I read science and anthropology and prehistory uh, like, you know, other people do, but uh, I certainly read it with a huge grain of salt. Hmm. Yeah, there was actually uh, uh, an article, I was actually trying to find it just now, but just a couple of weeks ago, an article came out uh, talking about the cave paintings in Europe, mm -hmm. not far from where you are, as a matter of fact. Right, right. Um, and it was a stunning article, actually, to me, because they actually uh, had in print that a consensus had developed 
uh, and that consensus was among paleontologists that at some point, in some, you know, sometime within the last, I don't know, 35, 40, 50,000 years, that this outburst of creativity that was represented by some of the, the amazing works of art that are, that are done on the, on the walls and the ceilings of these amazing cathedral-like caves uh, in Europe, that they were the product probably of shamans uh, under the influence of some sort of a, a botanical psychedelic. And, of course, this is something that you know our, our good friend Terence wrote about many years ago, and he didn't get any credit for it in the article, and it was shameful, I thought. But, uh, but the idea that this is becoming a mainstream idea uh, was, I thought, pretty important and, re- and, and really cool, as a matter of fact. Well, that will certainly help. Mike, I think that'll certainly help people to come into uh, more respect and understanding of shamanism, because uh, mainly because those sites do exist and they are of spectacular nature, so that catches people's attention. Mm. And if people are told that it it might have been the case, as you say, that they are somehow connected with entheogenic shamanism, trance states, and so forth. Uh, it's a good way for people to get on to the, to the uh, subject of shamanism, certainly. All right, well, we're, we're talking about, about shamanism in a, in a context right now that you mentioned, uh, and, I, and I'm talking about these, the psychedelics, I guess. Uh, Metzner wrote about the mushroom. We're talking now about uh, the shamans who did cave painting and ritualistic ceremonies uh, in the caves in Europe. Uh, that was directly related to these sort of things. We've, we, we certainly know that in South America there are, there's a, a lot of evidence for the sacred mushroom religions down there historically. Um, and there is in Europe as well. And in Europe. And I think this is yeah. a, a, one thing that, 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 Met, that Metzner points out that's so important, that there is a, a, a European tradition of this as well. Uh, but let me ask you about the Western history. I mean... This stuff has been around for millions of years, but in the West, it seems like it just sort of got on the plate of Western science maybe a hundred years ago with, you know, the Germans uh, isolating mescaline. But then I don't think until the 1950s when Gordon Wasson brings psilocybin back to the West that anything really gets uh, interesting. And, And very soon after that, all of this stuff was made illegal. So it seems like there was very little time uh, for Western science to even assess uh, with, a, with a reasonable lens what was happening with these things. Sure. Well, I think there's a, <clears throat> a more or less, uh, of course, we're talking about a very complex historical problem. How did it come about that the use of, of sacred plants and the practice of entheogenic shamanism uh, has been made illegal, has been condemned by culture, and put under a very serious taboo? It's a huge question. But I think uh, it would be helpful to uh, point out one thing, perhaps. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to talk uh, sometime in the course of the morning about what I see as the three generations of, mm. the, of the current shamanic revival. And <clears throat> the first generation uh, was actually European, and it began with Robert Graves and Maria Gimbutas. Mm. Uh, Robert Graves, of course, who was a British poet who was very, uh, uh, who wrote The White Goddess, who was very, uh, interested in, uh, the mysteries of antiquity and lived, uh, although he was British, he lived in Palma de Mallorca, which is an island in the Mediterranean, uh, belongs to Spain, and took, himself took, uh, psychedelic mushrooms and rediscovered the traces of mushroom cults in Greece, Portugal, and Spain. And it was actually a letter from Robert Graves to Gordon Wasson that cued him to uh, go on his quest. Wasson had actually two cues. One of them came from, this happened in the, uh, in the 1940s, mm-hmm. just before and during the Second World War. Okay. He had a cue from Robert Graves, and he also got a cue from uh, Maria Gimbutas, who was the Lithuanian archaeologist. Hmm who uh, has done, as you know, this wonderful work on rediscovering the goddess cultures in, in old Europe, as she called it, which is the Balkans. D- does that include, like, the, the, the historical references to Minoan Crete and places like this? Yeah, she, she didn't particularly treat uh, Crete 
and, and Minowa. That was more something that other people picked up. But she was, Gimbutas was the one who established by archaeological evidence that before civilization rose, according to this usual scenario, civilization rose in, arose in the Middle East around 4,000 or 4,500 uh, B.C. Mm -hmm. She established that before civilization arose in the Middle East, there were in old Europe, which yeah. is the Balkans, and in Turkey, uh, highly advanced civilized societies, not huge urban societies, but small-scale human communities that were quite complex and sophisticated, and they were all goddess-oriented. Yeah. And having come from Lithuania, where there's a considerable mushroom culture closely related to the mushroom culture of Russia, remember that... Uh, Wasson's wife was Russian. Russian, yeah. Yeah. She also gave Wasson a clue leading him to the into the Soma, toward the Soma. Mm. And so the initial clues that launched the revival of shamanism today came from two Europeans, and they were picked up by an American, R. Gordon Wasson. Right, right. Now, <clears throat> getting back to your question, Mike, I think the problem is that the taboo against uh, the use of these uh, plants, these sacred plants, because we're not talking about drugs or chemicals here, we're talking about plants that are found in nature, Syrian rue, the Psilocybe mushroom, in various uh, species, uh, the Amanita, and so forth. Mm -hmm. The taboo on those was uh, established in the Middle East and spread into Europe, and it's essentially a part of Christianity and a part of the Judaic Christian tradition. Uh, as you know, the story of Adam and Eve and the, and the uh, tree in paradise has been interpreted as an entheogenic mm -hmm. story. Sure. And the forbidding of jo Jehovah's forbidding Adam and Eve to eat of the tree represents the taboo placed by Judeo-Christian religion on entheogens. Yeah, that's a wonderful metaphor and, and uh, it's really interesting when you think about it because at the root of that story in Genesis it's really uh, denial of access to a plant. That's right. I mean that's what, that, that's what the story and is. It's denial of access to the knowledge that comes through that plant. It's, it's denial of access to the plant species that are able to teach us about being human and able to teach us about the cosmos. And so the Judeo-Christian religion begins with that taboo, and consequently I think it's fair to say that Judeo-Christian religion, uh, and following it Islamic religion, which is of the same development really, uh, is based on the denial of our connection to the divine intelligence of nature. It's not surprising that those religions have led us to a very, uh, you know, genocidal and suicidal brink where we just, where we stand today. To get back and, and complete my response to your question, the taboo was established originally through this Judeo-Christian monotheism. I'm not the only, you know, I'm not. Oh, yeah, yeah. That story isn't original to me. You you know mm -hmm. that I'm sure. And and then it spread into Europe, and so the the taboo was established in the minds of Europeans for many centuries before they came to the New World. So we must understand that when the Europeans started to come to the New World in Columbus's time, and even more uh, later, say in the 18th and 19th century, when they poured across the United States, they were people who had already had that taboo enforced in their culture and in their minds for many, many, many generations. Mm. And so it was a foregone conclusion to them that there could be nothing, it could, it could not be allowed. It could not be allowed to exist. And so to the extent that the settlers encountered that, um, those practices, uh, for instance, uh, we know a lot about them encountering those practices in central Mexico, right. which is where Watson went to, to retrieve it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But insofar as they encountered them, they not only had the religious uh, demand to destroy uh, indigenous wisdom, but they also had, a ta they acted out the taboo that had been enforced on them. And the result of that was a, was a wholesale 
denial and repression of the entheogenic and shamanic way of life. Mm. But it seems like it was maybe a little bit of a too big of a cookie to bite into because you know the western style is sort of to completely assimilate and and subjugate other cultures literally swallow them up you know and then turn them into another extension of western scientism but to me it seems like the psychedelics were too big a bite to swallow and and they literally became taboo maybe for that reason because they because they literally because they really are dangerous in other words they were not only were they made illegal to you know you and me or 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 whomever back in the mid late 1960s but they were also taken off the menu of scientific research you know Mm -hmm. which is crazy i mean back in the middle ages you know the 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 medical students used to chase around armies and uh, go to the executioner's gallows at night you know to try to find uh, dead bodies and stuff that they could examine because the church had uh, made it uh, illegal to 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 examine dead bodies so the students would go out and you know find them in the field or whatever just so they could try to learn physiology or something and uh, now it seems like that uh, that that sort of scientific enthusiasm has been replaced by I'm not sure what government grants and uh, corporate budgets or something but mm -hmm. it seems frustrating though because uh, uh, I don't know it just seems like it never got a fair shake well uh, <clears throat> I would have two observations about that Mike one is that in the first place and this is just my personal opinion mm -hmm. I don't believe that uh, as you know I draw a very strong distinction between drugs and psychoactive plants I agree yeah it's and I problems, also yeah. cite Terence who said that the psychedelic message is an anti-drug message mm. and that's a very uh, important soundbite. Uh, I do not endorse the use of any drugs of any kind, chemical drugs or laboratory-made drugs. Uh, I, uh, you know, Schultes and others, uh, Schultes and Watson and others have taught us over the last 30 years that of the many uncountable plant species on the earth, there is a tiny sliver which have psychomimetic properties, about 200 species uh, is what Schulte says in Plants of the Gods. There are about 200 species that we know of today scientifically that create when they're ingested that act on the chemistry that already exists in the human brain mm -hmm. on the neurotransmitting chemistry. And those are the sacred plant teachers which were recognized in many cultures around the world uh, for thousands and thousands of years now, to respond, uh, to reflect uh, on what you were just saying, uh, I personally don't consider those psychoactive plants to be dangerous. Mm. Of course, one can take them wrongly. One could poison oneself if one did not make the correct ayahuasca formula or if one did not prepare it correctly. Mm. And there are, there are psychopharmaceutical things that one needs to know. But in terms of their effects, I do not consider them to be at all dangerous. They have never been forbidden because they are dangerous. That's, that's, the, that's the lie of the paternal patriarchal control system. They've been forbidden because they give us ecstasy and wisdom. And the controllers in society do not want the members of their society to have ecstasy and wisdom. It's the last thing they want them to have. So that's why they've been tabooed. And on the other hand, you're absolutely right. It's impossible to repress something of that nature. So what do you have as a consequence? Well, Terence has written about this extensively. You have a society of addiction. Hmm. All right. Well, let's talk. So that, that goes back to the statement that you made that I think really is profound, that the, the psychedelic message is an anti-drug message. Maybe you absolutely. Can, why, why don't you expand on that a little bit? Well, uh, if you look at our society, I don't think I would be, you know, raising anybody's eyebrows if I said that our Western society, let's just talk about America and Western and, and Europe, the Euro-American culture, is a culture of addiction. We are not only massively addicted to laboratory chemicals and drugs, our food is loaded with these chemicals. Uh, we are addicted to tobacco in a very evil form, not the kind of tobacco that the American Indians smoke in their peace pipes, mm. 
but a, a polluted form of tobacco with over 120 additives in it, which are known to be cancer-causing. We are addicted to alcohol, which is an extremely dangerous drug. We are addicted to pills of all kinds. We are addicted to bad food. And I won't even go into the other aspects of addiction, for instance, you know, uh, technological addiction, the Internet, and, you know, atrocious forms of entertainment. Let's just leave all that aside. Let's just talk about our addiction to substances. And Terence made the observation in uh, his uh, Food of the Gods, mm. that or Plants of the Gods or whatever, yeah, that sugar and coffee and the way that we the way that we are addicted to these things is a reflection of is the negative reflection of what has been taken away from us hmm. that craving for ecstasy and wisdom is so innate to us to our species that if you take it away as you, as you say it, it, it's a big bite to to remove hmm. it's a it's a it's a big need to deny if you deny that need in a society the consequence will be to drive that society into addiction. Hmm. So, to me, drugs, I hate the word drug, drugs belong to the addiction and to the problem, but psychoactive and entheogenic plants belong to the healing and the solution, hmm. and they should never be confused. Wonderful. Yeah, it's such an important distinction. I mean, the, the, one, of the, one of the major obstacles we have is the problem of language. I mean, just the fact that we use this one word, drugs, to somehow embody, uh, you know, all of these different substances, things that do everything from make your toe tickle to uh, make you see God, you know, and they, and they, they, they put uh, one word and try to wrap it around all of these different things. And then they use the same word in somehow a completely different fashion for all the pharmaceuticals that are somehow legal. Exactly, and it's, it's, I think it's very intentional on the part of some people. I think that, that using that word uh, in, a, in an extremely misleading way is part of the taboo and, and part of the disinformation campaign against, uh, against shamanism. Hmm. All right, John, look, let's uh, take a break and uh, come back and talk a little bit more about this stuff. Uh, I've got a few more questions for you. We've got some more time here, so... Let's do that. We'll take a break, listen to a little bit of music, and we will come back with my guest. His name is John Lash. And information about John can be found at www.metahistory.org. You can also go to my website at mikehagan.com and uh, jump right over there as well. This is Mike Hagan, and you're listening to Radio Orbit. My guest tonight is John Lash. We're talking to John live from his home in Belgium. Lucky to have him uh, in the morning time on Tuesday for him and just approaching... Uh, 15 minutes until 1 o'clock in the morning here in the middle of Missouri. So, all right, John, uh, thanks for sticking around. Well, thank you, Mike. It's a great privilege to be here and also uh, a great opportunity to talk about this particular subject because I do uh, believe that when we talk about shamanism in a sober and even-minded way, we are really talking about the deep, deep look and the deep view of uh, of the human psyche of human evolution and of the whole religious dimension of human experience is tremendously important subject but having said that and before we proceed I, I wonder if I could just make one statement uh, I, I do have a reservation as well which I'd like to make clear to our listeners <clears throat> I don't want to in, in stressing the importance of this subject I don't want to come across as if uh, as if I'm some fanatic who's insisting that everyone take uh, entheogenic uh, substances. Mm. I certainly am not. I certainly don't even believe that. In fact, one of it's not for everyone to do. Uh, in fact, one of the interesting questions that we face in terms of the contemporary revival of shamanism is who would be the shamans in a community? Mm. Suppose, for instance, that we, you and I, and a group of friends formed a community somewhere in, uh, in Costa Rica. You know, we decided we were going to go create an echo village. We don't want to be part of the system when it comes down. And so we create a community of 150 people in some wonderful conditions, you know, in, in Costa Rica. Right. And one of the essential questions within that community, within that echo culture, would be who takes the, uh, who does the practice with the entheogenic plants? 
because, it, as a matter of fact, it's not something that is easy to do, and it is is something that must be done with great discretion. Uh, and the inclination to do it is not always present, even uh, to people who have done it a lot. Uh, and then there are very there are there are int- what I'm trying to say is that there are intrinsic cautionary measures in this experience. Yeah. Which need to be recognized, but the the most important thing is that a sane society, a sane culture, will consist of some people who do the entheogenic practices, a great many people who don't, but the people who don't will understand and communicate with the people who do. <laughs> That's the key. Right, right, That's right. That's the key. But I'm not coming off. Please don't anyone interpret me as coming off and saying you must do this and everyone must become a shaman because I don't I don't believe that yeah I, I, I think it's I think it's good that you make that clarification and we've talked about you know we, we talk about this relatively frequently on the program and I try to make it uh, the same point that this is not recreation uh, it's something that requires understanding uh, long before uh, long before the voyage you know and I remember one thing that Terence said a long time ago uh, in an email to me. He said the first psych- the, the first trip in the psychedelic voyage is to the library. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, he it, had a way of putting it very well. Yeah, you know, yeah. Inf- inform yourself. You know, find out what's happening. Look at the pharmacology. Look at dose response. Look at uh, you know how these things react with the neurology of the brain, and then uh, you know you can go in with a with a little bit of a different. Uh, a different set and of course we all know now that this is the big thing you know how you go into the experience is as important as as the the substance that helps you get there yes your mindset there must be preparation as you know I distinguish very rigorously between uh, recreational and sacramental use mm. and uh, while I don't want to come off like a bigot and condemn anybody uh, Personally, for me, I do not do recreational use of psychedelics, and I do not support it. I agree. Um, and, but sacramental use is what we're talking about here, and that that is ritualistic. It, uh, the shamans in every society were not, uh, you know, ignorant pig farmers who happened to eat mushrooms that grew out of dung. <laughs> uh, they were educated. They were bards, scholars, poets storytellers, historians, healers, physicians, astronomers, astrologers. And so there's a great body of and a great discipline that goes along with this practice. All right, John. Uh, a little bit before the break, we were talking about European ancestry uh, that followed these traditions. I spoke to a guy last week, who, uh, and it was just after St. Patrick's Day, and we did a program on... Uh, what he entitled the Irish origins of civilization and he went uh, into uh, great depth about the Celtic origins of some of these things and and uh, we talked about Peter Lamborn Wilson n- no his name is Michael Tsarion and, uh-huh. and uh, he's very interesting and uh, there's a book by Peter Lamborn Wilson called Irish Soma really yeah and it's a book about the use of uh, I suppose Amanita Muscaria mm, uh, among the uh, ancient Celtic and Irish cultures, and particularly in connection with the Bardic cultures. Well, this is exactly what we were talking about last week, and we really didn't get deeply into the shamanic side of it, but certainly uh, uh, that was a, that was a component of it. And he, you know, a lot of people don't like to talk about these things, John. Mm. And uh, you know, you get you get too close, and then it becomes well. You know, we just don't go there. But, but certainly in the Druidic uh, line, there is uh, there is evidence of of the mushroom again. Oh, certainly. And uh, you know, I, I spent a great deal of time exploring sacred sites in the British Isles, in Scotland, Ireland, England, and Wales. Wow, tell us a little bit about that. Well, there's a great concentration of sacred sites in that part of the world. Uh, because to the Celtic peoples uh, who lived there and the other indigenous peoples of Wales, who the not even the non-Celtic and the Celtic, but as you know, the Celtic was kind of the unifying culture. Mm. Uh, the West, the direction of the West, was the direction of the afterworld, where people go in the afterlife, and it was also the direction, symbolic direction, to go uh, on the Germanic quest. And so most of the uh, 
great uh, stone circles and megalithic monuments are located in the west part of, of Scotland, the west coast, west coast of Ireland, Wales, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I've visited, you know, dozens and dozens of these places and spent time there. And uh, at the same, uh, those places in themselves will change your consciousness. Just being there in them, if you allow yourself to 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 uh, to be fully present, or if you meditate, if you want to use that word, or, or surrender control of your mind and and allow yourself to 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 float and to access what's there, those stone circles, by their very construction, by the ambience of them, will change your consciousness and and carry you into shamanic states. Hmm. But in addition to that. Uh, mushrooms grow all over the place in all those parts of 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 the British Isles. Mm -hmm. uh, they grow in in profusion in Wales in o September and October. Mm -hmm. So there's no question that uh, they were there and that they formed part of uh, of uh, of the practices. But you know, of course, uh, you know I, I don't think any fossils of mushrooms have been found. You know. So evidence, that kind of evidence doesn't exist. Right. right. Yeah, you know, you eat it. You eat the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then and then and then do a, create a, an alchemical transmutation on it. You know. That's right. That's right. But but graves just add graves uh, totally connected the bardic tradition of the Celts mm -hmm. with the use of uh, psilocybin mushrooms. Okay. Well, yeah. I think I think it's important because. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, Ralph Metzner earlier, and, and he mm -hmm. he also wrote, uh, and in fact, I didn't even read the book that you mentioned earlier, but I, re I read uh, Well of Remembrance, mm -hmm. and there was a piece that you actually sent to me a couple of days ago that, that, that remarks about that book, but he, he makes it clear that it's important that for us as Americans, I think, uh, in the West here, most of us do have European roots. Mm -hmm. And and there there's a tendency to flock to South America or to Mexico and go do ayahuasca with a whole bunch of gringos around a fire with a, a shaman of questionable uh, <laughs> intention or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's important to recognize that there is uh, a root in many of our own traditions. It's just a matter of, of, of recognizing it and going and looking for it. It certainly is important. And at the end of the day, you just have to conclude that the... Uh, the practice of uh, entheogenic shamanism was, was planetary, you know, mm. and you can find it in Siberia, Polynesia, uh, Wales, Portugal, Spain, uh, Greece, Mexico, Nevada, Arizona. There it is, you know. It's a bio. It was uh, a bioregional phenomenon. Mm. Well, all right. So, so this is its background. Where are we now? In 2006. Good, good question. I mean, 36 years, question. 40 years after, uh, 50 years after after Gordon Wasson brings it back. I don't know. Where right. It was 1957, actually, that the Life magazine article appeared, bizarrely enough. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Uh, yeah. He went there, I think, in 54, but it was 1957 that the cover article of Life magazine was about magic mushrooms. <laughs> right, right, and shamanism, yeah. So that will be next year. That'll be 50 years. That's when I got to go on eBay and see if I can find. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that magazine sells for a lot these days. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, so here we are, 2006. It's been 50 years, and and, mm -hmm. and, we, st and we still haven't come to terms. But uh, but, but what do you see uh, uh, happening today? Well, I I consider today that we're in the you know to use a a, a technological term. We're in the 3G, the third generation mm. of, uh, of psychedelic and psychonautic technology. Uh, the first generation having been Graves, Huxley, and Wasson himself, and of oh, course yeah. Albert Hoffman. Right, right. 1947, Discovery of LSD. Mm. That was the first generation of psychonauts uh, who brought back and uh, reconnected us to this uh, shamanic path. Then Wasson, of course, belongs to that generation, but also bridges into what I would call the second generation, and that would be uh, Wasson, Schultes, Leary, uh, Michael Harner, people like that. We're talking about the developments that sprang from uh, Huxley's books on masculine and psilocybin and Wasson's retrieval of the mushroom cult. Uh, so that
then we would go, the second generation goes up until about the early 80s. Mm. You know, Watson himself died in 86. And in 80, in 81, I think it was, or in the early 80s, he and, 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 uh, and Carl Ruck and, uh, another, uh, and Jonathan Ott wrote The Road to Eleusis, mm. which is kind of the, the, uh, consummate statement of the second generation of psychonauts and and that uh, the thesis of that book in case your listeners aren't familiar with it is that the the potion that was drunk by the initiates at the mysteries of Ilyusis was an entheogenic potion using uh, the fungus of ergot so essentially it was a liquid form of of LSD Uh, and that thesis called the Wasson thesis there are two aspects of the Wasson thesis one is his thesis that Soma can be identified with the Amanita muscaria mushroom. And the other aspect of the Wasson thesis is that the kikion, or the, the sacred drink of Eleusis, was uh, an entheogenic brew. So those are the, are, 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 were tremendous developments that came out of the second generation. Now we're in the third generation. And, uh, by the way, Ralph Metzner is, is the one person today who spans all of these generations. Right, right, right. And uh, Albert, I guess, uh, Albert Hoffman's still alive, too, but... And Albert Hoffman is still alive as, as well. But, but Metzner, to me, is really the outstanding figure because he was there, you know, when this thing kicked off. Hmm. And he's still here, and he's still as, as, uh, sober and lucid and, and, and warm and wonderful as ever. Amazing. And stands as, as a great, as a living monument to this, this, uh, this development, but specific to the third generation, I would say would be people like Mike Hagan <laughs> and uh, Terence McKenna, uh, Jonathan Ott, who was born in 1947, uh, and Dale Pendel, who's written this uh, wonderful trilogy of books on psychopharmacosis. Yeah. And uh, I would put myself and Joanna Harcourt Smith in there, although we're old enough to be, you know, considered as part of the second generation as well. And the whole question is, now I think, Mike, what does the third generation have to say? What What is our unique contribution to the revival of shamanism? That's one question. And the second question would be, as we were talking uh, just a minute ago offline, uh, where can we see this practice emerging in the world today what is the appropriate way and the safe and sane way for this practice to be to be redeveloped well it it seems to me a little like um a uh, a growing up of sorts in other words in the 60s it seemed like the people that were experiencing lsd and some of the other psychedelics thought that they were discovering something for the first time they really had little uh, knowledge of the historical uh, facts of shamanism. That's now, right. You know, now we have 30 years of, uh, thanks to people like you and, and, and many of the other people that you mentioned, uh, we have 35 years now of research and background that now legitimizes uh, this uh, many of these ideas and really uh, puts them on firm ground. And I think that, that, that that's a significant difference between that's now and That's tremendously important. Uh, you're absolutely right, Mike. The ethnographic and anthropological background we ha- we now have is tremendous, and that was developed by the second generation. Mm. Uh, Terence himself, as you know, acknowledged that with uh, with deep gratitude. Terence said that uh, he was uh, very fortunate to belong to uh, the 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 phase of the psychedelic movement uh, that was not just, as you say, taking psychedelics in this kind of naive way and thinking we discovered something that was never known before, but uh, having uh, an understanding of shamanism and anthropology to go with it. Mm. So that's where we are, and the question is, in this third, where is the third generation going to go, and where is it, how is it going to set up uh, what, comes, what comes next? All right, John, well, look, uh, let's come back. It's the top of the hour. I need to take a short break here, but we'll come back and do that. We'll talk about uh, where we want to go next, and maybe you can give some insight into how we maybe get to some of these places, okay? Great. All right, sounds good. My guest is John Lash. Information about John can be found on the web at www.metahistory.org. All right, this is Mike. You're listening to Radio Orbit. 
We'll be back in just a few moments. Furthermore, we have not even to risk the adventure alone, for the heroes of all time have gone before us. The labyrinth is thoroughly known. We have only to follow the thread of the hero path, and where we had thought to find an abomination, we shall find a god, and where we had thought to slay another, we shall slay ourselves, and where we had thought to travel outward, we shall come to the center of our own existence, and where we had thought to be alone, we shall be with all the world. John, that's a quote from one of my favorite mythologists. His name is Joseph Campbell. I'm sure you're... Sure, Hero with a Thousand Faces, yeah. And uh, I wanted to read that because I know that mythology is a big part of this, and there's a connection between shamanism and mythology and the past and the future. Mm -hmm. And I thought that maybe we could try to bridge that a little bit and talk about that as we discuss shamanism and its potential to help us into a new future or a future at all. Uh, and maybe you could discuss a little bit about, about mythology and the connection there. Sure, I'd love to. It's very appropriate, Mike. <clears throat> I uh, have, uh, of course, you know, studied Campbell's work on the hero. He's very well known for his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. But I also wrote a book on the hero, <clears throat> which is this little book published by Thames and Hudson in London called The Hero, Manhood and Power. And uh, I take a, a, a rather different view from uh, Campbell, that is, I don't exactly adopt his model. Uh, the point that I make in my book is that to understand the hero, we must have a view of masculinity, mm. change our view of masculinity, uh, and uh, understand that throughout history there have been men who have aligned themselves to the goddess and to the feminine powers in the universe and have been in service and adoration of the feminine. And there have been men who have developed their power against the feminine. And, uh, in, in, and to me, the true hero is the uh, man who develops his power and realizes his manhood uh, in service to the goddess and not uh, in the attempt, as patriarchy has done, to, to overcome and defeat the goddess, hmm. uh, which is a theme that... Uh, Many myths seem to suggest, uh, you know, man against the female monster type of thing. So it's an important background to understanding the shamanic quest because, in a sense, of course, the, the, the male shaman is uh, uh, is a hero figure. But of course, the that's only part of the picture because uh, shamans have also been females all through history and continue to be today. And uh, Barbara Tedlock, as you know, has just written a wonderful book on the feminine, uh, the, the role of women in shamanism. Yes, yes. Uh, I think one of the great opportunities that shamanism offers us today is that it does offer this gender balance and that both men and women are equal in this quest. Mm, yeah. Very interesting. You know, the, uh, th this idea of, of men as shaman is another one that sort of is a, a co-opted yeah, ide co idea. Co yeah, yeah, it the, is. Yeah, because uh, yeah, Barbara makes uh, has written a wonderful book. It's called "The Woman in the Shaman's Body," and uh, and she even makes a point to talk about Iliad, Merce Iliad, who, uh, although his work was certainly uh, very valuable and and uh, and, imp and important, he she points out some of his own bias, where uh, wherein he actually uh, where in cases he actually eliminated, you know. Uh, segments of, of of the of the feminine role in shamanism in some of his own research. You know? Oh, absolutely. There are some things to really watch out for in uh, in Eliade. Uh, I I've drawn deeply from Eliade. In fact, I'm much more the heir of Eliade than I am of of Campbell. Mm. But at the same time, I would warn that in re particularly in regard to shamanism and in his classic book, which for many years was the main reference. Archaic shamanism, archaic techniques of ecstasy, right, you know, right. buyer beware. Right, right, right. Uh, there are some things in there that are just not right at all. 
Yeah. Well, and that's the way it goes. I mean, there. I mean, of course, you we know, all make mistakes. I'm right. sure I've made I've made my share. Right. Uh, and that's how we learn through our own mistakes and through detecting the mistakes of other people. Absolutely, well said. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, look. Um, the the future uh, of shamanism and the present. I mean, what do you see in Europe right now as regards to this? The, the just the uh, just the zeitgeist. I mean, what's the what's the sense of these sorts of things over there right now? Well, in terms of the the predominant culture, that would would be to say the you know the ordinary culture, popular culture. There's absolutely zilch, mm. and certainly Europeans are far far behind America in that respect. Is that right? Uh, yeah, Europeans have not woken up to many many things. They they are people who tend to be very opinionated. And very nested in their in their idée reçue, hmm. in the in the ideas that they've received and in the scripts that have been passed down to them, they tend to be very conservative, very uh, passive, uh, intimidated by authoritarian figures. Uh, so, in the in the general uh, in the in the general uh, panorama of European culture, European life, European intellectual life, and so forth. Uh, there is almost no awareness whatsoever of uh, the importance of the things we're talking about. So you have to really ask the question, well, is there a counterculture in Europe in which these things are known and, and in, in which these things are emerging? Uh, because in the, in, the, in the mass culture, there's, there's nothing. Okay. All right. We, we haven't talked too much, actually, about why shamanism is so important. In other words, we touched a little bit early on about nature and this idea mm -hmm. of, of the connection to nature. And, and I know that uh, this is one of the primary roles of shamanism is to, mm -hmm. to, to be that bridge, the link between, as you mentioned earlier, the, the natural world and the worlds that are outside of that, uh, uh, mm -hmm. of that arena. So let's talk a little bit more about that, about why, why, why is shamanism a better idea than Christianity or Islam mm -hmm. or, or, or Buddhism or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, you raise a, a very important question, Mike, and I think that we uh, need to be extremely conscientious, those of us who, you know, s s rather take the role of discussing these things publicly and somebody has to, you know, kind of not set an agenda but uh, bring the subject into definition. It's, it's, a, it's a big responsibility and one must, one must talk as clearly as possible and one must be able also to make uh, very subtle uh, and crucial distinctions uh, for instance I would say first of all that uh, we're talking here you and I right now about entheogenic shamanism now there may be other forms of shamanism and, and in fact there are yeah. uh, which do not use entheogens that is to say uh, dance, trance, drumming mm -hmm. uh, nature vigils, nature quests uh, going out into the wilderness and spending time with maybe fasting and uh, having a vision quest but not necessarily taking psychoactive plants and again I want to make it clear that I uh, you know I don't have a totalitarian mentality about this uh, I'm not insisting that entheogenic shamanism is the best and only way it just happens to be what we're talking about here now right. Uh, so as far as uh, uh, shaman, shamanic practices, uh, uh, and, and in fact, in terms of Europe, there are workshops and there are groups uh, all around Europe, in Germany, France, Italy, and Spain, who do kind of vision quests and Michael Harner type of uh, shamanic, uh, shamanic workshops. Mm -hmm. You know, that does exist, uh, and I don't discount that in the least. But uh, your question focuses on the subject that you and I both uh, share a deep interest in, and that is what is the role and what is the value of the shamanic experience with sacred plants. Uh, so I think this is important today for uh, a very simple reason, uh, and I can put it in one word, Gaia. Mm -hmm. Uh, what we have today in the third generation is we have the Gaia hypothesis and a growing understanding, not just in the counterculture, but in actually in popular culture to some extent, that 
the earth is a living entity, a living, intelligent, self-organizing entity. And I would say that the great step that we can make, or perhaps it would be better to say we stand on a threshold now, in the third generation of the Germanic revival, we stand on a threshold where the practices with sacred plants could be taken in the direction of uh, Gaia communication, hmm. in the direction of a deepening of our contact and understanding of the living planet and possibly even direct communication with with the, the intelligence of the planet. That's right. Well, something like that is at work. Uh, for anyone who has, you know, actually had this experience uh, and done it in the right manner, in the right context, at the right dosage, in the right set and setting, anybody that's had, had this experience knows that there is something going on like this. I mean, there is a communication, an intelligence that is outside of you. I mean, there's no other way to explain it. At least not to me. And but there's I... a paradox here as well, Mike, and I'm sure you're aware of this. Uh, those people who have uh, who have had this experience or who have spoken to friends who have it and who have a sympathetic and trusting attitude toward those friends and, you know, willing to listen to their experiences, mm -hmm. uh, all know that when you ingest a psychoactive plant, you give part of your consciousness away to the species. Mm. To that of the species it's a it's an act of interspecies communication yeah, really yes and there's an exchange that takes place parents often discuss this for the for the pleasure of joyriding in our nervous system <laughs> which is what these entities do they like to be in our mind mm. and for the pleasure of being in our mind they give us part of their mind mm. and part of their mind uh, brings our attention away from human affairs, away from ourselves, our own personal identity, away from culture, and toward the world of nature and the living intelligence of nature. So it catches your attention. Your attention is brought to that. But there's a paradox here, Mike, because uh, I'm sure you would agree that even though it's easy to say that uh, entheogenic practice will lead us to Gaia. In fact, there's very little reference to that in any of the literature. Very true. It's it's odd, don't you think? It's really strange, and it's it's one of those things that I, I again I I'll have to quote T again, but it's a secret that keeps itself. Yeah, you could say that something yeah. like something like that. I mean, I have this. I, I also have this sort of intuition. You mentioned that it's a it's a it's an interspecies communication. It's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. and, That's right. And part of it, to me, and again, this is—I'm just speaking from my own experience, and I'm not going to—you know—I'm not speaking for anybody else. There seems to be a choice that's involved. In other words, you make a choice to to eat the mushroom, for example. There also seems to be, as silly as it sounds, a choice on the part of the mushroom to 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 uh, involve itself in the uh, in the relationship in some way, shape, or form, because it can it can be unpleasant. I mean, if you're an ego maniac control freak uh, and go into one of those deep experiences, it will take you by the short and curly and just throw you against the wall. You know. Well, that's their job. They're guardians. They're guardians, and you are not. No one is going to go into the deeper intimacy of those circuits uh... leary called them the rapture circuits mm. rapture circuits no one is going to be no human being and this is just the way it's set up by nature itself like no human being is allowed to go into those sacred realms and bring their ego and their expectations and their projections and their personal shit with them <laughs> and so that's why if you take uh... psilocybin mushrooms and you have not previously prepared yourself for ego death and surrender, they're going to give you a very hard time. Mm. Because you, you will not be allowed to come in carrying that ego baggage. Right. Yeah. So it is, uh, you know, it is a two-way exchange, and, and, they, and the sacred plant teachers act not only as teachers, but as guardians of what they're teaching. 
Amazing. You know, yes, I, it is. It it's is fantastic. A, it is amazing. And, uh, you know, when you, I personally think that Gaia herself created these entities, produced these 200 rare psychomimetic species out of all the millions of gorgeous and fantastic plants as a special gift to us to help us with the affliction of being human <laughs> and to help us get over being human. You know, uh, uh, David Abrams has a wonderful saying in his book, The Spell of the Sensuous. We are only human in contact with and communion with all that is non-human. Hmm. And these plant teachers allow us to make that communion happen. And, uh, and there, as far as I'm concerned, that's, uh, if we are going to move now, knowing the planet is in crisis on an environmental level, if we're going to move toward a more sane way of life, I do feel that uh, these plant teachers could help us very much to guide us in that direction. All right, and that is, uh, that's where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. That is it. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, um, let's see. Let's talk a little bit more about women, then, and the role of the feminine in this whole thing. Oh, great. I'd love to. Well, you know, the biggest woman in my life has, is called Gaia. Mm-hmm. And uh, some people say uh, that that's just a metaphor, and some people object to you know, the goddess revival of this language and calling her a goddess. But I can only say that uh, I'm a poet and I'm a mystic. And in my experience, uh, the intelligence and the physicality of the earth is feminine. Mm. And uh, I'm not the first one to say that, you know. Uh, races and cultures from time immemorial have said the same thing. Why do they say that, you know? I don't know of any single culture, any single myth that claims that the earth is male. And there's a reason for that. Uh, and uh, so not only is do we contact the divine feminine through the earth, but women, the females of our species, have a very, very key role in, in preserving and maintaining that connection. It's total disinformation you find in, in Eliad that, uh, uh, you know, men, men, men have been the dominant players in, uh, in shamanism. It's just not true. Right. And it's a very uh, unhappy piece of, of uh, it's a very unhappy mistake. What do you make of the, of the prehistorical evidence of partnership, community type, uh, Situations like may have existed on Minoan Crete and places like that. Do you think that that's uh, a legitimate historical situation? Uh, let, let me clarify really quickly, John. Uh, what I'm thinking sure. is that that idea, this idea that at some point in the past there was a partnership community or a, or or, an, or a, a situation where men were in balance with women and all in balance with nature, that sounds a whole lot like the nostalgia for for paradise that we all. Uh, mm -hmm. See, you know, represented in all of these religions, and I guess it just seems to me that, may, you know, maybe there was a time like that. Maybe we really were, th you know, thrown out of the garden by Yahweh as Narc, sort of, you know, as you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, and we've been suffering from that ever since, and we're just trying to get back to the garden. Well, I think it's kind of a trick question, Mike. Uh, I think that there is a risk, and I would, uh, I, I'm, I'm wary of this myself. There is a risk uh, of make-believe. There is a risk of, of wishful thinking mm. and wanting to pretend that it was once that way. And, uh, of course, we need to be cognizant of that. But when all is said and done, I would say, <clears throat> I would say this. It comes down to each individual. If, if you, man or woman, are able to find in yourself that gender balance and the tenderness on which it depends... And if you're able to, to find in yourself and in your own life a kind of harmonious triangulation between man, woman, and nature, then you have proven the proposition is true. Hmm. Whether or not it actually was realized in these cultures in the past, no one can ultimately say. But each of us can prove that the proposition is true in ourselves. Right. And that's what really matters. All right. Fantastic. 
All right, metahistory.org. Let's talk a little bit about your website and uh, and some of the things that go on there. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be able to say something about it because this website has been a tremendous gift to me uh, from the Marion Institute and from the Baldwin brothers, uh, Michael, Ian, and Philip, mm. who, uh, whom I work with, my collaborators and sponsors. And it's been a tremendous experience writing for this website over the last four to five years. Um, I want to make it clear that uh, Medi- the MediHistory.org, however, is not a website that broadcasts or that's, that was specifically created to broadcast or promote uh, entheogenic shamanism. Mm. As you know, Mike, there are very there are a great many uh, uh, psychedelic sites on the web. Uh, many of them, and many of them have forums, and there's an enormous amount of discussion going on about uh, all kinds of psychedelics, mixing them with drugs, mixing them with sacred plants. Uh, for instance, there's a there's a site on the web called deoxy.org, mm, yeah. org, which is a, a fantastically sophisticated psychedelic site, which deals with shamanism, entheogens, and it's 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 really a brilliant site. Uh, the problem is, in my experience, that the deoxy.org and all the other sites in that uh, in that category uh, seem to be uh, created by and populated by people who are doing recreational use yeah. of psychedelics. Yeah, I've noticed. Uh, that. I've noticed that myself. Yeah, there is. They are genuine psychonauts, and some of them are genuinely trying to. Exp- you know, explore the psyche and the labyrinth of of the mind and, and cosmos. But in general, I don't find that though they are Gaia, uh, pointing in the direction of Gaia-oriented shamanism, and nor do I find that they have the emphasis on sacramental use rather than recreational use. So when I started writing uh, Metahistory Org, I didn't have the intention in my mind that it would be a channel for this message. But it evolved into that naturally over uh, a number of years. And I, I really like the way it developed because uh, before I was able to actually come out and discuss the issues that we're discussing here in this conversation, on the site, I built a very extensive foundation for that discussion. Uh, I think it's very important to frame the discussion that we're having in a certain way, to frame it carefully and to establish uh, a sane and sober mindset. And that's what I was able to do because in its inception, Metahistory Org, as as you'll see if you tune into the homepage, has two stated purposes. One is to question beliefs and belief systems Mm. and try to go beyond the tyranny of beliefs, uh, especially religious and ideological beliefs. And the second purpose of the site is to propose a future mythology which would guide us toward a relationship with Gaia and a coevolutionary status with the planet. So those are the two stated aims uh, and I spent about three years developing the site in that manner before I began to introduce the option and let's remember that that's always what it is. It's right. just an option. Right of uh, entheogenic practice. All right. Yeah, and as you mentioned, I think it's important, uh, th- this, the whole idea of the spiritual side or the sacred side of, of these plants, these compounds, is it's not implied. In other, word, in other words, you, you mentioned earlier that there are a number of different ways that a shaman or a shamanic practice might be used in order to get into a trance state drumming or dancing or or, right. or, or ordeal or whatever but uh, assuming that we are talking about the ingestion of a plant it it may be necessary but it's not sufficient in other words it you definitely have to take the plant in order to get there uh, in your in your apartment or whatever but if you don't have the right again if you don't have the right intention and uh, understanding and all these sort of things uh, it it will not be, as you say, maybe a profound connection with uh, the Gaian mind that we're trying to establish. It won't be. I'll guarantee it. 
And I'll tell you that these uh, these characters, these species, are smarter than we are. Mm. So they They're play... smarter than we are, and you better pay attention to that. And one of the things that, one of the requirements, as you well know, for for serious a sacramental practice is is ego death. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, you have to let go of who you are, who you think you are, your pretenses, and all your personal ego baggage, and go into a condition of surrender in order to be able to brought to be taken to these experiences of deeper insight. I mean, that is just absolutely essential, mm. and uh, that's part of the set setting uh, requirement. Uh, okay, all right. One of the things that you talk about uh, at great length, and I'm very interested in it as well, uh, on the site at metahistory.org, and let's give out that web address one more time www.metahistory.org John one of the things you write you write about is Gnosticism mm -hmm. and uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about Gnosticism and the connection between Gnosticism and maybe a shamanistic revival of sorts because there's certainly a, a, a shamanic tradition in the background of Gnosticism as well there is indeed uh, the thing that I would say about Gnosticism is that uh, it is an unfortunate word, and it, it has been an unfortunate word since the beginning of its usage, which is initially found in Plato, uh, because it, uh, it has a lot of disinformation and negativity attached to it. For instance, uh, one of the first things that you encounter when you read into Gnosticism or pick up a book on it is that scholars have developed a model of what the Gnostic worldview was. And uh, according to that model, they say that Gnostics were people who viewed the world, the material and physical world, as a delusion or a prison created by an evil spirit, and that Gnostics proposed that the human uh, human beings are divine sparks captured in this darkness, and the purpose of the spiritual path is for us to free ourselves from the prison of materiality and, and sensual delusion. Mm. That model I completely reject. That model is not an accurate model of what the Gnostic uh, said or taught. It is a model that's derived from the Christian uh, war against Gnostics. Wow. It is a it is a uh, a model and a label that was placed on Gnostics in order to condemn them. Wow, and, John, uh, that is. I'm sorry, I got to jump in, but that, that that's amazing that you said that, and I'm so glad you did because there have been a number of different people that I've read over the years that I could only describe as dark Gnostics. I mean, they are just as dark as they come, mm -hmm. and 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 uh, and although there was information there that that rung true to me, and I was like, well, yeah, I understand this, and it makes sense, but. Uh, I was always like, no, it, 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 I, I never bought the whole idea of the demiurge and all of this sort of stuff, uh, that was, and, and that we were just uh, a, a mistake or, or the accidental humans and that sort of thing. I, uh, I, I'm sorry to jump in, but I'm, I'm really no, excited to say that. No, you have good instincts that, there, so. and I don't think you're alone in that. Uh, I suspect that there may be other people who read into Gnosticism and who are have this model thrust upon them, this erroneous and misleading model, and uh, maybe are shaking their heads and saying, well, this doesn't sound quite right to me, you know. Uh, unfortunately, it's very difficult to sort out that disinformation and get through it. But I have attempted in the Metahistory site to uh, propose another model. And in my model, uh, I would substitute the word Gnostic. Uh, for the word Gnostic, I would substitute the word uh, Illuminist. The path of Gnosis, Gnosis was a path of Illuminism, psychosomatic Illuminism. Uh, Gnosticism was a sophisticated form, a sophisticated outgrowth of European shamanism going back to the Stone Age. Uh, this is, by the way, what uh, Kenneth Rexroth says in his preface to Fragments of the Faith Forgotten. It's a book on Gnosticism by uh, G.R.S. Mead. Wow, what a it fantastic a, title. Yeah, Fragments of a Faith Forgotten. It's a great title. Uh, and my, uh, to sum up a very difficult and complex subject in a, in a sentence, my fix on Gnosticism is that Gnostics were seers who used uh, psychoactive plants and also used uh, Kundalini Yoga, hmm. techniques of, of Kundalini Yoga, uh, to develop a highly sophisticated uh, 
worldview based on their direct perception of of Gaia. Uh, they had a a central figure in their mythology, a goddess. The central figure of the Gnostic uh, worldview is a goddess, as you know, called Sophia. Mm. And I've argued all through the site, you can see this, there's a word search function on the site. If you put in Sophia, all this material will come up. Or if you go to the, the Gaia Sophia Navigator, it will take you to all the places on the site where I discuss this. Uh, I am arguing that the specific focus of the Gnostic and mystery tradition in Europe was uh, entheogenic practices focused on Gaia, focused on the goddess Gaia or the goddess Sophia. And so that represents for us a model that we can take today in our understanding of Gaia and possibly the model for the future development of shamanism. Wow. All right, well, look, um, it is about 23 before the hour. Let's take a quick break here. I've got to take one more. And then we'll come back and uh, we'll have uh, a few more we'll minutes. We'll do a final segment. We have about 15 minutes, right? Yeah, we got about 15 minutes, okay? Excellent, Mike. All right, John, hang on just a second. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. All right, everybody, this is John Lash, and uh, we're lucky to have him. He's live with us from his home in Belgium, and information and tremendous amount of material that John has uh, uh, researched and developed over uh, a number of years can be found at www.metahistory.org. And uh, we'll be back with John in just a second here. And we're going to cut it a little bit short here and get right back to our guest, John Lash. All right, John, we're back to you. Good to be here. All right, yeah, we got about uh, 15 or 20 minutes left, so uh, a little bit of time to talk a little bit more about some of these things. Hey, um, I wanted to ask you quickly, I know you were, you were at the Albert Hoffman conference uh, mm -hmm. What was that? Two two months ago or something like that? Yeah, sixteenth of January. Yeah, maybe you can give us a little overview of what your what your thoughts were about uh, uh, about what went down there. That was in Basel, I think, in Switzerland, right? Yeah, sure, sure. Well, it was a tremendous experience. Uh, there were fifteen hundred people at the conference, and uh, it was three solid days: Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to the end of the day. Albert Hoffman spoke at the beginning of the conference and at the end, and it was his 100th birthday. It opened on his 100th birthday Amazing. Uh, on a full moon. Amazing. And uh, on a Friday the 13th. <laughs> I mean, it was pretty spectacular. Uh, it was tremendously moving experience for a number of reasons. Uh, one, because Hoffman was there and he spoke in such a beautiful, humble, and childlike way mm. about his discovery of LSD with such enormous respect for that that entity and how it called him and how it brought him back to his love of nature as a child. I mean, it was deeply moving. I, I wept like a kid, and many people did, mm. hearing him speak. Um, I also felt uh, throughout the whole conference the, Mike, I can't tell you the impact that went over me like, like a wave. It was like a, a tsunami of grief. Mm, really? Yeah. Yeah. A tsunami of grief for my generation and what we have been through and for the the great uh, opportunity that I've had I was born in 1945 <clears throat> the great opportunity that I've had I was 15 years old in 1960 mm. and to have been part of this 60s revolution and of the psychedelic Delic Revolution, which is only just a, a name we put on the, the, the re-emergence of something in the human spirit. In the 60s, something re-emerged in the human spirit through this, uh, this, uh, this shamanic uh, retrieval that we've been talking about. Right. And we had a fantastic opportunity to change society, to change ourselves, to, to, to reconnect with humanity and all of that was blown away and destroyed uh and there are you know it survives now in certain individuals but it does not survive as a social movement of any kind uh LSD was made illegal i'm not a pro LSD person particularly i'm not against it either I would, perhaps i should say that you know, to me LSD is kind of like trainer wheels on a bicycle <laughs> 
if you want to have a, a test run of a entheogenic experience, then take some LSD. But if you want to go on the trip itself, LSD is not going to take you there, you know. Mm. But it was tremendously important that it opened the window of opportunity. Mm. And then I relived with many of the people at the conference, because many of them were of my generation, uh, relived the grief of what happened to that window of opportunity and how it was shut down and how the 60s went bad, really bad, mm. really fast. John. How many people were lost along the way. So it was a tremendously moving experience. I was shattered mm. at the end of this experience. Joanna as well. Yeah. We both were. We laid around for a couple of days. Uh, we, we could barely move. Huh. I mean, it was, it was emotionally very, very powerful. On the other hand, in terms of the content and treatment of the conference itself, uh, I had two, uh, Objections. One, it was very white male intellectual. Mm. Uh, most of the lectures and the talks were almost professorial clinical talks. Really? Yeah, about LSD and chemistry. Right. Uh, there were some women. There were about three or four women presenters, and there were about 40 or 50 men presenters. So there was a lack of the female element. There was too much white male intellectualism. And getting back to an observation that you just made before the break, uh, there was a lack of the sense of the sacred. Mm. And that was the most unfortunate thing. I didn't feel that at the conference. There was a lot of reverence for Albert Hoffman. And there was definitely a kind of reverence, an attitude of reverence toward LSD. And in that sense, you might say there was a, a sense of the sacred, but not, not sufficient to me. It was, it was, it was lacking. Yeah, amazing. Well, powerful yeah, experience. It sounds like it. And I have to I have to uh I have to wonder, you know, this thing that happened in the 60s that you that you talk about that was that that was uh that went bad as you put it, you know. Mm -hmm. Where are the people, you know, where is where are the other John Lashes? I mean, there were lots of there had to be many other people as you say. I mean, there were there was a whole generation of of people that that had, to varying degrees, these experiences, and they're now in, you know, middle age and in corporate America or in positions of power or whatever. Have they just lost the, those experiences and 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 no longer uh, incorporate them into their worldview? Or, or I mean, it seems like, uh, for for me as a person who's had the experience, I, I can't let it go. I can't just walk away from that. No, no. Well, this is something, of course, that Joanna and I talk about a lot. Joanna Horcourt Smith being my best friend of 20 years and my partner on the Meta History site and a great psychonaut in her own right. Uh, you've had Joanna, of course, on your show. We talk about this a lot and ponder it a lot. And we ask ourselves, well, can we be the only ones? Well, of course, we're not so arrogant as to imagine that we are the only ones. We know we're not. We just uh, suffer because we know that there must be survivors of that phenomena of that of that vast cultural upheaval who still are holding the essential truth of that moment mm -hmm. and those people need now to connect with each other for the benefit of future generations the problem mike is is not that that uh, that that the 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 true survivors of that moment aren't here the problem is that they, they don't know each other. They're not connected. They're scattered. Mm. They're scattered. But I'm sure there are some. And of course, the 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 one that is known is of course Ralph Metzner. Right. Ralph right. Metzner is the holder of the continuity of the whole process, mm. as far as I'm concerned. He embodies the continuity, and he embodies someone who was there at the beginning. He was there in the middle, and he's there now. Wow. Uh, so Metzner is, is a wonderful sign of hope for us, and a wonderful symbol that the movement uh, and the moment of truth uh, c continues. But I would be so happy if somehow the, those uh, people who are scattered around the planet would somehow get in touch with each other. And maybe that's what we'll be able to do through the wonderful site you're now doing with Joanna on our Future Primitive Project. Yes, and we, we should mention that really fast. Uh, and I've talked about it on the program before, but we're very close to uh, releasing the first program, uh, Future Primitive. 
It can be found on the web at www.futureprimitive.org, and that's a, a cooperative effort between myself and Joanna and John Lash at Meta History and uh, the one. It's the people. twin site to Meta History. Yeah, yeah. And whereas Meta History is very text heavy, uh, I'm the main author, and it's mostly written. Uh, Future Primitive is going to be uh, uh, a vocal, and it's dedicated to oral traditions. That's right. It's going to be lectures and, and talks and interviews like this. And the purpose of Future Primitive is to try to create a, a higher sense of community for the future. And I believe that, that uh, the subjects we're discussing today are going to uh, be important elements in, in that community, in the communities of the future. I agree with you, John. You know, um, you make this point about Ralph and about how important he is. And mm -hmm. I, I, I want to extend that a little bit because one of the, the most interesting things about shamanism and indigenous cultures in general is this idea of uh, the elder people in the tribe passing down tradition and sharing and teaching the younger. And we have a complete loss of that in our culture. We've got pretty we much do. a disconnect yeah. between young people and older people. Yeah, young people totally diss older people. Yeah. And, and as and, I get and, older, and, I experience it. I'm talking from experience, and I'll tell you, it's very painful. Oh, it, it's like it, I'm discounted well, because I'm older. It's uh, it's weird because uh, it is. In, in, in my in my atmosphere here, and I'm in a college town, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I spend a lot of time out and about and, and stuff, and I, I have a, a reasonable relationship with, with the generation of younger people, uh, but, but it takes a tremendous amount of effort, and there's always, uh, it's, it's not at all a natural thing for them, you know what I mean? It's no, not, it isn't. It really seems like it's not, and it's unfortunate, because when you break through, uh, when you break through those barriers or whatever and you actually can get down and start to have a conversation which is something that I learned because most of my close friends now are people who are older than me I realize mm -hmm. that this is where the information is right <laughs> and uh, so uh, and and I in some way want to want, want to try to continue that to, to, to pass it on to people that are younger than I am you know that have mm -hmm. a, an ear to listen but but you're right it's not at all like uh, like it might have been in a no. pri in a primary culture where that's just I'm, the way no, it works. No, not at all. I'm mm -hmm. usually concerned about this, and I do believe that in 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 future primitive communities or emergent communities, mm -hmm. as I would like to call them, that this transmission from the older to the younger generations would be uh, re reinstated. But also, likewise, I would add, there is a transmission from the younger to the older generations right. as right. well. Right. And that is because. Uh, young people come in with an endowment of knowledge of their own. They're not just recipients of the wisdom of older people, but they all they 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 should be receptive to receiving the wisdom of older people. But they also have wisdom to give of their own, and uh, that's a beautiful exchange that uh, really has been taken out of our world, and and our world is much much the poorer for that. Boy, I agree with you. It really, it, it really saddens me to see the way that uh, our uh, our elderly people are, are are looked upon, and it's totally disempowering for them as well. Because it's almost like when when you feel that, that that no one is interested in you know the information that you might have or the conversation or whatever, well, it it automatically you shut down. yeah you shut down and it becomes of course. Less, it just becomes less important to you. Yeah, isolation, you know, Mike, I'm glad that we're, we're getting close to the end of our time here. I'm glad that this subject has come up. Isolation is one of the greatest threats to human survival. Uh, the isolation of the individual in technological cocooning, you know. Mm -hmm. Everybody, uh, walking around with the, the input to their, uh, their iPod stuck up their butt, you know. <laughs> I mean, this is not, uh, this is not a species that's going to survive. Uh, isolation is a, 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 an entheogenic shamanism cannot be practiced in isolation. Right. The, the the thing that the psychonaut discovers must be brought back and shared with people who did not take the journey. Mm. Yep, I think that that's a, you know that's that's such a key to this thing because this idea of isolation that's what Western culture does it builds walls it creates boundaries it creates barriers that's the whole business of western civilization well it goes back to the taboo 
when Jehovah, who is the Gnostic demiurge and a demented God who works against humanity, this is unique to the Gnostic myth, mm -hmm. when Jehovah prohibited our primal parents, Adam and Eve, to eat of the tree of knowledge, that was the first great feat of isolation. That meant that human society and the human species was going to enter a path where it sought its own identity and its mission purely on its own terms. It sought to understand itself in isolation from nature and the cosmos at large. And we see now where that path has taken us. There, I argue, as you know, Mike, that there can be no reconciliation between uh, the Gaian worldview of connection and the Judeo-Christian Islamic religion, which severs us mm. from that connection. Wow. Well, what do we... Is there a resolution? Or what is the resolution? The resolution is that those of us who carry the vision of Gaia and the love of Gaia in our hearts uh, have to connect and have to create our own, our own world uh, and not uh, in some way, uh, you know, outside or beyond the culture of, uh, of religious, uh, of, of, of patriarchal ideology. That's the challenge, and it's a mighty big challenge. Well, I believe it is possible. I believe it is too, and I and I also see that. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm just lost. You know, I don't know. But I see those systems in uh, in decline. I don't. They are in terrific decay, just, and and you all know, we all know, that even the people who are invested in those systems don't believe in them anymore. You know, but the trouble is that that decay is infectious, and that mm. decay is not something that. Who knows? Well, maybe the decay could pr provide a compost, mm. because that's the purpose of decay, right? Right. To provide right. a compost for healthy communities in the future. I don't know, yeah. but we're still in an adversarial situation with uh, with those ideologies because they're life denying. You know, mm. the most important thing to 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 remember when you're thinking about shamanism is that it's a path of knowing through ecstasy and ecstasy is our birthright mm -hmm. ecstasy and rapture are our birthright they are what a, a newborn child experiences they are what a mystic experiences they are what an illuminated person experiences they are what we glimpse when we stand in front of a magnificent waterfall and that birthright we have to reclaim it from the ideologies that have denied it to us that is the most single most important warrior deed that we can perform today. Wow, John, fantastic. And a, a, a fitting way to end our time, I think. I think so. I think that's a good note to end on. It's good to, to end up in ecstasy. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt about that. All right, well, John, it has been a pleasure, a long-awaited pleasure, and uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. And uh, we will get this thing up on the web in uh, 24 hours' time or so and make sure a lot of other people have the opportunity to uh, to share it as well. Well, thank you, Mike, not only for this interview, but for all the great work you do on your radio program. And thank you for uh, what you're going to be doing on, on Future Primitive. And we'll be talking a lot in the future. Yep, I'm looking really forward to uh, whatever that might bring, but certainly adventure, and uh, we'll keep trying to move some of these ideas forward, John. Okay. All right. Take care, friend. Wonderful. I'll talk to you soon. Sure. Bye bye. Sure. All right, everybody. John Lash, the wonderful John Lash. www.metahistory.metahistory.org.